Hello and welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. Today we're going to hear from artist Susan Lee O'Connor about her work and her journey to make the work for this show. Uh, this exhibition is Paper Routes, Women to Watch 2020. It's a partnership with the Ohio Advisory Group to the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And without further ado, I introduce Susan. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Um, I'm excited to show you my work to talk to you about my process and we're going to get started right away. So I was born in Taipei, Taiwan. Taiwan is an island that is off the coast of mainland China. You can see in the diagram here how extremely small Taiwan is and Taipei is at the northernmost point um, on the island. Um, my mom and dad um, are here in the center. They, this was their um, wedding reception photograph. And to the right is a picture of my sisters and I, and Lily is my younger sister here on the left-hand side. Um, Jean is my older sister in the middle there, and I am to the far right. Um, In 1980, my family moved, immigrated to the United States, and my dad had already been here in the States for a year previous, uh, working on his um, MBA, master's um, in a uh, bachelor's degree. And he moved to Arizona, um, and so that's where we moved in um, 1980. Um, a lot of things that I remember there, whoops, we went too fast here. Um, we were there for a year, and the thing that I remember the most was that it was extremely hot, very dry, um, and lots of cactus. I remember just being uh, little and dry, just walking around with family members um, and falling on cactus, um, and that's something that you'll never <laughs> forget. A year later, we moved to New Jersey. Uh, my dad had a job transfer and um, to Maplewood, New Jersey. Um, and that's where my formative years were. Uh, we grew up in a small town, just about an hour away from New York. Um, I highlighted two images here. E.T. was the first American film that uh, I saw and watched and it just left an, uh, a memory in my mind. Um, the other memory I have of New Jersey um, is the restaurant Roman Gourmet, and it had the best New York style pizza. And it's funny because uh, some of those things that, you know, sort of our lasting impressions, um, when we eventually moved to Ohio, um, that's still the, the main thing in my mind, trying to find the best New York style pizza. So in my senior year in high school, uh, my dad had a job, job transfer and we moved he moved us to uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I finished out my senior year at Westerville North High School um, where my first influence in the arts um, came into my life. Horace Miller was my high school art teacher and uh, really sort of um, embedded in me a lot of um, the lessons and values that I, I still continue to carry with me. Um, he introduced me to the Columbus College of Art and Design, and that's where I ultimately um, landed for grad under uh, undergraduate school, and that's where I met my husband. Um, so, finished out my years in Columbus uh, at the Columbus College of Art and Design, and I took a hiatus uh, of almost about 10 years, um, 12 to actually to, to be exact, before I, I decided to go back to get my master's degree um, at Ohio State University and in, in sculpture. Uh, in between those years, um, I wanted to show some of the influences and artists that I was looking at in my undergraduate years. I was really interested in um, illustration. I started out in illustration and then shifted gears to fine arts uh, my junior year in, at college. And 
really, you could see sort of the transition of some of the illustrative types of works that I was interested in. Um, and as they started to sort of shift and uh, change to some more of the uh, contemporary artists that I was looking at. The one thing I realized in my formative training in the arts was my interest in uh, patterns, repetition in forms, a um, lot of sort of monochromatic types of palettes. And I was really interested in a lot of different um, artists. So not just sculptors, painters, um, very specific genres, but artists who were really delving into a variety of different types of mediums. So when I started working, um, I started in painting a lot of different mediums, but my connection to the material became more apparent when I started working with um, Anne Hamilton and the graduate committees at um, Ohio State University. And she really brought my attention to the fact that so much of the, the materiality, um, you know, I was really interested in, in the permanence and impermanence of material. And that's what drew me to paper. Um, and here, the, my two, two of my um, biggest influences in my current work, um, you can see the impermanence of the books from Anne Hamilton's Book Weights from 2010 um, to Maya Lin's work, uh, The Systematic Landscapes. And that's all uh, built uh, with um, wood construction. So you'll have to forgive the blurriness of the images. The, these were um, old works. Um, I started back in 2002 to show you some of the works. Um, they continue to kind of have consistency in terms of um, the conceptual base um, as well as the material that I'm exploring. Um, and so, but this was older work. And so the, my, my uh, camera technology was not as advanced. And I was really starting to get interested in um, ideas of identity and forms um, taking shape with variety of different materials. Um, some of the things I was really fascinated with was just how to take uh, my training from two-dimensional works into three-dimensional uh, materials. And this was just an active engagement in playing with materials, trying and exploring different things, um, seeing how they might connect to one another, uh, working with similar like-to-like -like material as well as extremely disparate types of content and supplies. So here's two additional pieces from 2006. And in 2008, um, I applied to graduate school and that's when I um, really delved more into the permanence and impermanence of materials. Um, this was a series that I did um, at OSU um, and I, there was no titles to these. It was just a mass tape series where I just uh, was interested in exploring how one single material uh, could be the the headliner, as it were, and also the, the device to adhere and bond to one another. Uh, so I did a series of these, um, and they were quite large scale and some smaller as well. Um, it was really fascinating to see how the material could stick together and then over time really degrade um, due to temperature changes, um, flux in the environment, and how it would start to sag. Um, there was even an odor, a sense of smell to the actual types of masking tape, depending upon what brand that I used that I found was really interesting for um, people actually walking into the gallery spaces. This was also done during my time at um, OSU. Uh, I was still interested in um, identity and looking at um, anonymity um, specifically. And so these are drawings that I did. Um, again, excuse the um, blurriness of the photographs. But these were um, drawings on newspaper and specifically front 
page images where there were um, a lot of um, color um, and um, actual human beings where I could sort of um, include them into the drawing itself. And this is the type of uh, imagery that I was trying to do um, were on individual sheets of the newspaper. Um, and I thought that it would be a nice way to create this very um, organic um, idea of infinity, the, the symbol of infinity, and see how they would link to one another, um, but overlapping almost like a wall um, cut paper collage. So I started to draw larger images onto full sheets of the newspaper. Uh, and I did this series, there were 21 in total with plasticine models to go with them. And I was really interested in the human figure, but also trying to find ways to abstract them, um, blurring out the identity uh, and, and really not you know, necessarily highlighting the fact that these are or are not human, um, they just are slightly humanoid or having attributes to uh, the human figure. And these are all mixed media. So I have a variety of ballpoint pen drawings on top of uh, the newspaper. So the images that you're seeing, the colors are the actual images from the cover of the pages. And it's a light wash of acrylic and gouache with some areas um, of uh, white masking tape or white out uh, tape. So I started to play around with mixed media, um, continuing to play with mixed media and finding ways to appropriate um, paper onto the paper. Um, the image whitewashing um, to the left, there are strips of um, the, the felt telephone directory. And this was a piece that I wanted to sort of differentiate. It was sort of at a time when the uh, landlines were starting to become obsolete and finding a way to visually interpret that and what that meant um, um, in terms of lost identity or trying to find someone in the phone book. The image on the right, these were paintings that I was trying to, I was playing around with the idea of um, uh, thinned out just the physicality of the material playing around with acrylics and thinning out that paint, allowing it to drip. Um, these are large scale uh, plywood sheets from four feet by eight feet and exploring ways to expand and create larger scale images. Here's a few more of that same series. Also about the same size. And then in 2011, um, I had the opportunity to apply for a an experimental space um, to be able to use it for a full scale installation piece. And it was my first full scale installation. It was at the Krasel Art Lab, and I believe they still are running that space um, up in St. Joseph, Michigan. And it is a fantastic organization. Um, they allowed me to bring in all sorts of material. What I was really interested in in my proposal was creating a space that could feel as though it was immersive. Um, so a full scale installation, this room itself was approximately uh, 200 square feet, give or take. And I took a van of materials up, um, spent um, a little part of uh, about a week or so up in that area, um, just you know, sort of putting all of this together, moving things around and so, observers and people walking through the space would be able to almost experience it um, as though it were some of the paintings that I had. This, the, the goal was 
to try to create these denser kind of um, environments where there was depth. And uh, this was, a, like I said, an experimental first time um, sort of foray into installation work for me. And the responses I got were, were really exciting. Some people felt like they were walking into um, an underwater experience um, because of all the lighting and uh, the different types of textures and physical materials and patterns. Others felt like it was a cave-like experience going into a cavern. So it was a fun experience uh, and that sort of got me excited into creating more installation pieces. Um, and when I came back to Ohio um, in Delaware, uh, this, this actual space doesn't exist anymore, but the Delaware City Art Center at the time had um, an open call for proposals as well. And um, I was able to get this space the entire gallery space to create um, another installation. So this one was uh, also in that same year, 2011, and it consists of the MFA brochures. CCAD had just um, started their inaugural year in, with their Masters in Fine Arts program, and they had um, extra boxes, um, sort of the leftovers, as it were, of all these, um, the master's um, program brochures and pamphlets. Um, so I asked, and um, they said, yeah, go ahead and take it. And so what you're seeing is um, there is an armature structure that's built underneath of it. Um, and then I stapled, um, this was all on site and very site specific. So I stapled all of these, uh, it's the repetition, what you're seeing are the actual brochures. That following year, um, I had the opportunity to apply for a um, an artist lecture series and it was at the Adams State College in um, Alamosa, Colorado. Um, and I was able to uh, fly out and um, before, prior to that, they, they talked me through the space. This was, I don't have images to show, but the gallery space itself, um, the Cloyd Snook Gallery is the location. It is a round rotunda and with moving panels. And so it, it sort of circles around the entire space. So the example, what you're seeing here is a triptych um, and that entire rotunda, front to back, and then the outer corridor, uh, I filled with approximately 27 paintings. So these are uh, just three of the 27, and each one of these are about uh, four, 40 inches by 60 inches, um, each panel. So they were quite large, uh, unfinished, um, essentially, recycled um, canvas. Um, so they're vinyl actually on the one side and they're basically uh, vinyl coverings um, that I was able to find and recycle and use the backs of um, the canvases. And I was really interested in sort of hanging them without the actual um, process of uh, stretching them onto a canvas, um, putting it onto any sort of structure and construct. And I wanted to just be able to Number one for the the efficiency of flying them all out, and then also filling the space in a way that was going to um, be seamless with the curve of the walls. So, so I flew all of these out, and then they also resided. Uh, I also created a um, an installation piece that was suspended above the the rotunda itself. Here's a detail of the one of the panels. These are uh, acrylic with um, pen and ink, um, some mixed media additional materials involved in there. And then that following year, um, I decided I really wanted to jump back into working with materials and um, three-dimensional specifically. Um, and instead of full-scale sculptures or um, I should say installations, um, I was really interested in scaling up um, sculpture forms. And a, um, a colleague of mine had um, created a series of 
large scale installations out of Neutrogena bars. And I asked for her recycled boxes. Um, so out of all of the thousands of boxes, um, I was able to create a series that I entitled Burst Bubbles. And these were just a variety of different, um, various scaled sculpture pieces uh, that were site specific to each of the locations. And this was one that was, um, that was curated into the Poetics of Pattern exhibition um, that year, 2013 at the Rife Gallery. So there's an exterior um, image and then to the right, you can actually walk through the space underneath and be able to experience the interior space. Um, that following year, I uh, submitted a proposal to the Morris Graves Museum in Eureka, California, and was again able to um, do a series of drawings that I was able to ship out. And then I shipped boxes of just the it's uh, the Neutrogena boxes themselves and was able to create this particular um, sculpture piece that was site specific to that location. And this was a fun one to do in that I, prior to flying out, um, I worked with the curator and did a call out to the greater that, that community um, of artists, local business um, owners, to see if they had any wood, extra wood that they would like to donate to um, the exhibition. And it was going to be a temporary um, install where this, so the actual piece itself doesn't exist anymore. Um, neither do any of the other, um, you know, larger scale sculpture pieces as well as the installations. Um, and again, going back to my idea, thinking about permanence and permanence um, in terms of artwork how how would the work continue to live on? And it would essentially just live on through in, uh, documentation, um, as well as potentially um, sort of side uh, ventures of drawings and different types of uh, media. And so this was a piece that, that came out of that venture. Uh, all of the wood there is um, donated, donated for that specific piece and then was actually returned back. Some of it was uh, antiqued wood from one area uh, of that of this um, sculpture, which you can't actually see right now, but it's sort of on the back side, um, came from an antique shop, and he really insisted upon um, my using it inside of this piece. So I thought that was um, really fun to be able to include. Um, in the same exhibition, there was a series of smaller drawings that I did, and these are, I titled them ink blot uh, drawings. And there was just a series of about a dozen of them um, on a wall. And my inspiration behind this um, stems from the, uh, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, but the Rorsch um drawings, where it's a psychological um, analysis of ink blot drippings um, that participants and subject matter would decide they would say, oh, this looks like this and reminds me of this. And then um, that, that um, interpretation would then be analyzed. So I, I started to play around with the idea of creating my own sort of stains, ink blots, um, but really with a precision of drawing out um, what those sort of slivers and extra little droppings would look like. Um, in a, in a much more sort of controlled way. So these are drawings on layers of mylar, vellum, some tissue tracing paper, um, as well as the base is a, a more solid support of um, Bristol paper with um, micron pens. And each one has a variety of different layers. So this one to the right in plot two has just two layers. You can, some of them you can see very distinctly. And then Inkblot uh, 9 has um, at least four layers on that one. So this piece um, was put into the Morris Graves Museum exhibition, um, but I did create this in 2013 um, at uh, in a residency that I had um, at the Dresden, uh, in Dresden, Germany. And it was through the Greater Columbus Arts Council um, that I was able to travel 
um, with my husband and my son, and we were able to, they were able to come join me for a certain um, part of that trip. Um, it was extremely memorable. We were able to, uh, I was able to get set up in a studio. Um, and the best thing that I, I, I thought to do there instead of working with three dimensional materials was to just take a roll of really big paper and start drawing there. And this is what I brought back. One of two large scale drawings. And this is the other one. Um, this is a lot of mixed media found objects from Dresden, some receipt paper, labels, um, paint samples, etc. And then in uh, 2014, I was hired on, I started teaching at the Columbus College of Art and Design. And I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> in 2014, I started teaching at um, Columbus School for Girls. And I took a hiatus from um, making work in the studio and in, and then picked it back up again. So in, in uh, the transitioning years, uh, continued to kind of work and uh, not really show and exhibit as as often as I would have liked. But then in 2017, was given the opportunity to um, apply to a teaching residency slash artist residency at the Cleveland Institute of Art. And so for two weeks, I was able to work with other educators and jump back into uh, the painting part of my practice. Uh, so what came out of that a uh, couple of weeks and then that following year were a series of paintings that I did. Uh, this is mixed media um, cut paper collage with um, a lot of um, drawing and acrylic painting um, on top of it as well. And these are fairly small. Uh, some of them are smaller in size. These two are about, about uh, 20 by 24 inches. And I was really interested still in identity, but sort of what is, you know, in terms of architectural identity and thinking about um, some of the architectural sort of um, derelict uh, buildings and construction and how we see certain areas of beauty and others um, that are just sort of left to um, go to waste. Um, I was still also thinking interested in repetition and forms and lots of different sort of spaces that could um, translate to a three-dimensional space. Here's another piece that um, I created during that time in the residency at CIA and a couple of detailed shots. And then I bounced back into three-dimensional work, specifically working with um, masking tape Again, uh, I was able to, I was curated into this show at the Cultural Arts Center and it was titled Hypothesis, where sort of the worlds of the art world and science worlds sort of collided. And um, this was a really great opportunity for me that I saw to be able to get back to um, working with the three dimensional qualities and um, that sort of ephemeral feeling with uh, masking tape. So this one is titled Leaf. And then I did another piece, Teardrop, um, for that same show. In um, just this past year, the Art Unbound 3 exhibition um, that Stephanie Rond curated um, at the Metropolitan Library um, came into existence and I was fortunate, I was so excited to be a part of this exhibition. I'd always wanted to, you know, sort of work with Stephanie and um, our, just the way that things worked out, it just didn't happen until this past year. And this was in conjunction with um, the James Thurber um, house and specifically the, um, the poem, a last, the, the parable last flower. Um, and so this was our, uh, my sort of response to it. And thinking about identity again, considering um, the topsy-turvy world um, that we're sort of living in. And I titled this North Does Not Meet South, East Does Not Meet West. Um, specifically, um, 
to kind of connect east to west, um, north to south, of course. But in this particular piece, there really is no right way to, to look at it. There's no front, there's no back. Um, either area, either um, sort of direction that you look at it um, is intended to be the right way and the right direction. Um, and it's mounted onto the wall, so you can really almost traverse it um, without it being on a pedestal. And here is a view uh, of the work in progress in the studio. And it leads me to this show and this exhibition. So this was um, a long time in the making. This, this took several months um, in terms of uh, collecting materials, um, rolling newspaper. And I, I used specifically, I wanted to, to use um, Chinese and American paper um, and be able to create these sort of um, the sense that these were islands, um, as well as sort of uh, um, landscape terrains. Um, and there's, each one of these are fairly large. And as we will be sort of walking around the space, you'll be able to kind of get a sense of um, size and scale in relationship um, to, to me um, as I'm walking through it. Um, and the interesting part for me is the the final install um, when i'm working on these pieces at home um, they definitely don't take on that type of um, it, the size and scale that it would in a space where it's a little bit cleaned up a true sort of white cube as it were um, and so the relationship um, to each one of them is really interesting seeing them in a space like this as opposed to at home where each one just sort of lives in its own space for a little while. Um, this is the first time in the gallery where I'm able to have them all together. Um, they were all sort of just stored in corners of the house until it was able to be installed here. Here's a few shots in the studio um, as I was working on them. And then I'll be able to show in terms of a demonstration here shortly, how to, um, how I actually uh, did the process. Thank you again so much for sharing your time with me. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we're gonna take a walk around. Okay, hopefully you can hear me at home. So I think one of the things about this piece, um, what I wish that we could do with the audience is to be able to kind of walk through and um, take a look sort of around and in the space itself. Um, part of, uh, I think the, the parts that are interesting are there you can kind of see it from a distance. Um, and as we get up close, uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting uh, when we were installing this was the way that the light actually hits the surfaces. Uh, there's a sense of iridescence that starts to happen uh, that I don't know that the camera can necessarily pick up on. Uh, but part of it, we do believe, um, was the part of the, um, I think the, the iridescence is coming from the actual hot glue that's in between the actual rolls of paper. And um, so that was an interesting part that I didn't necessarily uh, consider or think would be an aspect of the piece. And um, that's the fun part about making artwork um, is that once it's done and you know you create it, you it sort of 
rests and becomes and has a life of its own. Um, in installing this piece too, once I knew it was going to be on this wall space and, and in this actual space, I wanted some of them to sort of live on the space on the ground, but then also be able to um, be suspended. And um, again, I don't know if your camera can pick up on, uh, but there's monofilament um, that heavier rest monofilament that actually supports and suspends the actual pieces. Uh, so they're woven into the actual rolls of the uh, piece itself and then suspended onto the ceiling. And so some of those, um, the subtle uh, striations of the wire, the repetition of that, I, I really enjoyed seeing that in the journey. Um, something unplanned, um, but as we were standing in the space, we were able to kind of figure out how to um, make that happen. I think another interesting aspect to working modularly, which is really what I did, I, I worked on one piece and then it got shoved into a bedroom, <laughs> a, you know, a, a guest bedroom space, and then it went onto the studio to open up and basically another piece uh, so that that into the other, uh, you know, in the same guest bedroom. So it was interesting to see this populating in a, a corner of the space in our house uh, where, you know, it would just live and reside until the time came to bring it to the gallery. Um, I think the lighting portion also helps in terms of figuring out, um, you know, how this will live in a gallery space once it's outside of the studio, um, outside of the the maker's um, space, as it were. And it was fun to be able to light this um, and see how the effects of the light would play on the wall, um, and be able to see how it kind of connects and how the conversation these wall pieces. Um, having that conversation with the pieces on the, uh, the ground. Can you move the uh, closer to the mouth? Is that better? Thank you. The other aspects of this work that I really didn't realize would happen, and this happens frequently when um, in the studio, um, you think that the work is going one direction, and it really ultimately, when you install it, it really takes on a totally different direction. Um, in the studio space, you know, the, I mean, we're all familiar with newsprint and newspaper. The material itself is really light, uh, but once you, so twofold, um, two observations that I really noticed in installing this. Um, as, you're, as I was putting this stuff together, um, and of course the, um, hot glue uh, gives it a lot of weight too. But the more layers that I kept adding to each section, each component, the heavier and the denser the the actual pieces became. So structurally, um, they're extremely heavy and weighty. And uh, in terms of the, the lightness of the color, um, in the studio space, the actual newspaper reads as really light, a really light tan, almost um, not bleached white, but a very, very light, light color. Um, and in the space, they become extremely dark. And so the vast of contrast and value structure um, is, is really noticeable um, on in person as well as um, in film and on video. Can you talk a little bit about um, the first one that you made and what you recognized once you had them out and what was the question? So um, the question was, um, can you talk about the first piece that you made and um, you know the different sort of, uh, you repeat that again? So um, you recognized a difference kind of in the emotive quality of, of the work and like how you started and what you recognize in that first piece and how, yeah. how you, you talked about it when you installed kind of comparing it to your first space. Um, yeah, so the, so the first piece that I actually, that started this entire series with, 
uh, is this one right here. And one of the things that I realized uh, when I started working on this piece, um, this was a specific piece made for this show. And I realized the amount of space that I needed to take up. Um, and I also realized that I wanted to work with this material. Um, so this first piece was just sort of an experimentation, um, how I would teach any of my students, how I would uh, sort of, uh, you know, tell them to just experiment with, let, let's just see how this sticks together. And this one um, in particular, there was no formulaic, uh, no uh, routine or ritual that I followed. It was just really, let's roll a, a single um, roll and then roll another one and then connect them and start to see how they might actually um, work together um, to create maybe an undulation or a uh, something that might resemble uh, some form from nature, whether it's a wave or how moss sort of crawls and grows over a rock formation um, to, you know, uh, one, one of the things I didn't um, list in my um, artist talk uh, was in terms of influences um, that are outside of the art world. Um, and one of my biggest influences is uh, watching nature shows um, BBC's Planet Earth. Um, there's a new one that they have out now that is called Wonderstruck that we watch all the time in our household. And it's just fascinating um, how the, our natural world um, just sort of grows and kind of weaves in and out of one another. Um, there are moments where something is, is, has a duality of rigidness, really hard lines to soft curves and um, I had a friend tell me that um, this work really reminded her of that, that there's a sense of uh, imminent danger, but that there's also moments where it's extremely soft and it feels like it's because of the, the curvilinear qualities. Um, so this first piece um, was just sort of, let's, let's see what the material can do together, run amok, and um, can it stand on its own? Can it kind of uh, or does it have to lean against something? And the short answer is yes, it could stand on its own. Um, but on, in the underbelly portion, there's moments where there's it, it's as though it's um, trying to stay stable, but um, you know there there it's very tenuous. So the 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 following pieces, I did start to sort of self-correct or um, find ways. To, to sort of create a more um, a more uh, specific kind of form, and um, so bold or sort of like uh, landscape valleys to um, more hilly types of environments, um, areas that was much more topographical um, in the sense that. The closer you look, there's lots of subtle and sort of changes. Um, and you could also see how um, over time, the actual, this natural light, um, and this space is kind of permanent. It doesn't really get a lot of natural light coming in. But um, the, the newspaper itself is uh, surely degraded. So there's this sort of yellowing of the paper that's starting to occur. Um, and I find that, I, I like that. I like the fact that this sort of aging and um, what will last, it, this, this will last because it's rolled in and um, kind of connected one another uh, to one another with the hot glue gun, but ultimately none of that is permanent. And so this will eventually just start to really degrade um, and maybe just weather down and um, sort of weaken. Um, and I'm okay with that. I like the idea that um, some of this can just sort of live in this space for a little bit of time, um, you know, and, and move on to something else. So, Susan, there's another thing that happened with this piece that I think is really interesting. Let me turn it back to you. Um, that straight on, on top, it just eats the light. Yeah. And seeing it from the side, could you talk a little bit about how, what you've taken from that? Like if that has kind of sunk in in a different way, the way that one, if it's taking on the light and absorbing it, um, 
directly. It also casts these really extravagant shadows. And then the pieces on the floor you have, they, they almost seem like different material until you uh, navigate the space. Could you talk a little bit about that and repeat what you get out of that question? <laughs> I think I understand it, but so the, the question was, um, the way that the light hits these um, pieces that are on that are hanging from the wall um, seems to suck that light. It seems to just absorb the light, um, and I, I, I think it's really due to the fact that this paper is so matte finish. It's not a high gloss. Um, there's no reflex uh, reflectiveness to it, um, and you really the only time you see light is on the actual monofilament where there's moments um, that it's catching um, the glimmers of the light and then the other part of that uh, uh comment or question was that the pieces on the ground um doesn't seem to have that same weightiness or that um you know that the play on the shadows um and the way that the light hits the actual pieces on the the walls themselves um past i, I like that, that sort of description of these grand shadows um because of the like the longer rods of um newspaper that are the, the essentially the structure that sort of that they stand on on the ground are also the ones that are leaning into the wall itself. Um, so what's sort of floating, um, as it were, are the, the basically the smaller rolls of um, newspaper. Um, and so that is something that um, was unexpected in terms of um, when I was making the piece. Um, these were always made on a table surface. And so I, I actually, the way that um, I created them, I had to make sure that they were able to, they would be able to fit through our door jams in the house. And um, so one way to do it was to be able to strip these pieces on the actual napkin paper. And it was essentially, um, you can imagine, it just really kind of was the size of. Uh, the actual piece itself. So it's still a, a pretty decent surface area to work on, but they 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 rested on a flat surface all the time. Um, and so, you know, when it was time to install these and the time to, to really figure out how to physically get them up off the ground and be able to um, sustain the weight of it on the monofilament. Um, that was a nice surprise to be able to see and do the lighting. Um, you know, and, and my husband Darren, he's worked at the museum forever and um, was able to come in and help with the actual lighting of the piece um, as uh, Kat and I <laughs> sort of walked and directed around and talked about where we, you know, we thought the, the landing it would land and how the shadows would fall and everything. So that was a fun um, aspect of. Uh, a new sort of a nice surprise, as it were. So um, I think this would be a good time to kind of just walk you guys through how the process is. Um, it's, it's actually really quite simple. It's, uh, I always think it's, it's almost uh, like art therapy. Uh, so taking a piece of newspaper um, that I cut into strips, and they're about four inches by uh, you know, about about an inch to two inches wide. Um, what I would do actually is grab one more piece of paper here. So essentially it's basic material. Um, I roll large sheets of newspaper um, and I use masking tape to sort of on top of the The actual it are the rolls. So after I cut them into single strips, I um, have some moistened paper towels here, um, and I would just start to roll these 
into small little cylindrical forms. And then with a small little bit of tape, I would roll them into um, those little cylinder tubes. And then sometimes I would, what was interesting is it doesn't have to be uh, a, sole, a, a full sheet rolled from the bottom. So I would sort of cheat and work my way, um, fold it in half and um, to speed up the time. And it doesn't take very long at all to actually um, create those rolls. So once um, I filled an entire container, I would then start to play around, since I have the building blocks now, I would be able to just sit and start to put this together. So with a hot glue gun, I would take um, a couple of the rolls and slowly, one by one, start to attach them to each of the, the actual larger strips of the reeds, I call them. So as I start to place them, um, just allow, it's, it's really re repetition, kind of the same material over and over and over again. Um, and it doesn't take much time, but a little bit here, a little bit there, and then it starts to take on a shape. So what then would happen for each one of these, and as um, I was talking about the first one, how it really changed in terms of the kind of uh, shaping and the quality of it and how the others um, were also varied. It just depends on the location where you actually place each one of these. So I would shift, drop down lower in one area and then raise them um, in another to create that sort of um, sense of undulation and um, movement. So you can see how I can kind of um, just sort of contort or adjust the location of them. And then it would just sort of tear in a different way or stack in a different way. So that's basically it. And as the, the hot glue, this is a little bit more of a thicker, it's not the type you would buy necessarily at Michael's, but um, Lowe's, um, the, the more sort of heavier duty. This isn't even um, construction grade, but it is definitely a lot more stable than a crafting um, hot glue. Can you talk a little bit about material? Um, and what I mean by material is, uh, paper is not often thought about for material, and yet this this work, is, this entire show is about paper, and all of the artists have a very different way of approaching it. Can you talk about why paper is really important to you and your work? Yeah, I think that um, with this particular piece, because I have been already experimenting with um, the uh, actual paper for the Art Unbound 3 show, um, that one actually came out of um, the material I used for that was um, um, music scores, music sheets. And so you can visibly see some of those notes um, visual, visible along the edges of the actual piece itself. Um, in this particular piece, um, I really wanted to be able to talk about um, my, it, it, it's a sort of a personal kind of connection to, um, Asia being Asian, so using um, Chinese newspapers, um, you might have been able to see that as the camera was panning along the edges, um, along the edge of the actual paper, um, the connection between landscape to, um, to, to sort of a, is a metaphor for, for me to, um, to us, to human beings, and um, that sort of idea of, um, you know, um, what is what are we rooted in? What is that sort of foundation? Um, and are they islands? I think part of this sort of island connection to me is always prevalent because I was born on an island. I think that there's something intrinsically um, there for me to to want to be able to explore, um, and I'll continue to probably delve into that. Um, you know, the other aspect to that is just the the 
practical part is is that kind of uh, physicality of uh, modular pieces and figuring out how to be able to maneuver them and manip manipulate them. Um, I also am still really interested in figuring out how to create works that will live on for a duration of time, um, but maybe not in a permanent way, uh, like for example, you know, um, a bronze statue or something is, right? But then it's, it's fascinating to me now in terms of conversations about um, world events, how, you know, certain monuments are being, you know, torn down. And so, so there is these subtle, interesting kind of um, conversations that come up. Um, what, what's going to endure? What isn't going to endure? Is there um, some sort of legacy behind it? Um, and I, you know, I think this piece is still so new to me that I don't um, have all the answers. I think that there is a sense of, um, it'll live on and there'll be more meanings and, and um, that, that can come out of it. So we have a question from the audience. Okay. And uh, they would like to know if you could talk about your art making processes that are repetitive and if that connects to your spiritual practice or deeper meaning. Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I've always been drawn to repetitive forms for some reason, and pattern and repetition have always been um, sort of a, something that I've been drawn to, uh, just aesthetically. Um, I always feel that, and what's interesting is, um, I feel like it's a, it's a um, kind of trying to put order to chaos, um, and sort of there's chaotic order and um, like this sort of quality of, um, for better lack of better word for it, this yin and yang sort of push and pull. Um, and so in terms of spirituality, I don't know that I, I would necessarily connect it, but it's, there's definitely for me a calming. Um, and, and for me, that's what spirituality is, is finding a way to be able to center uh, myself and to ground myself. And, and part of that is, um, I do also think there is more to it in terms of island nation, um, um, Kind of mentality having been born on an island where you're surrounded by water uh but a sense of feeling like um you know there's there's a, a grounding and, and and having a sort of um some sort of rooted in uh something solid um and you know i, I think that um with this material and the process i think is important so having the sense that this is kind of impermanent material but being, but but it's all, it is it is kind of like a um, an act of kind of um, there is there is something very spiritual in that 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 sort of re repetition of movement to the repetition that visually I see and um, I'm trying to put out into the world. Um, for me, it is extremely um, calming. I do have a friend who actually just recently um, told me that. Um, and I don't, I'm going to forget the name of this, uh, but um, there is there is something where um, select number of people they they find extremely jarring um, the the visual uh, repetition that occurs in nature. And um, I'm going to have to research that some more because I thought that was really fascinating. What was really calming for me um, was extremely jarring um, and potentially disturbing to another human being. So. Um, you know, and I think that there's there's just a lot to for for me. This is why I keep doing this, and why I keep coming back to it. There are so many. Um, it's not a a, a very um, organized pattern. It's something that is like sort of come out of you know just sort of uh, I would think from nature, right? These these elements of like how does that um, the bumblebee, the beehives, and you know all those? They seem to take on. There's, there's definitely um, an order and a sense to it, but they take on organic forms um, surrounding it. So that sort of order and chaos is um, continuously at play in my process. So I have another question. Um, this one's actually for me. I, there was something really exciting about this piece when I I saw it coming through and going up. One. Um, it automatically made me think of one because you have the the Chinese new, newspapers and the American newspapers. Clearly, you're you're talking about what is that uh, relationship, 
in not only the title, but the material, like very, very titular uh, addressing of content. But the other piece that I found really interesting, especially when you elevated those three um, smaller masses, is that it really references the, I'm going to slaughter this, the Shan Sui painting, which is a, a traditional Chinese painting of mountains and water. And so like the, they're up in clouds and there's a distinct, like if you look at those paintings, there's a big gap between what you would recognize as round and what you would recognize as round again, but higher up because it's a mountain. Can you talk a little bit about your intention around that? Um, because it feels very intentional to me, but I, I just want to hear like uh, kind of what you're pulling in both conceptually on, on addressing content, historical reference, and current day? Um, that's a really pretty heady um, thought and um, observation that you had. Um, so I, being Chinese, um, born in Taiwan, raised predominantly in form of formative years um, and then I grew up uh, here in the United States uh, in the naturalized States. I don't have that um, history of traditional Chinese paintings in um, my work, right? And so, I mean, you're just speaking. Of, oh, got it. Okay. And um, so, so, but the acknowledgement, the recognition that there is um, that the landscape and the way that um, we actually do look at painting as well as um, you know, connected to historical context is really important to me. And I, I love that. Um, I, I don't want to directly call it out to this is my response to traditional Chinese painting, uh, but it is a, a recognition and to my background that that idea of uh, space and silence is actually really, really important to me. So that type, type of moment of a sense of um, is this land? Is this, um, you know, is this above water? Is this below water? Is this uh, some form of um, what part of the environment are we sitting in? Are we kind of floating in? Is, is really important to me. Um, so that living in that in between space is, is really key. Um, there isn't a sense of, you know, I, I see these and I call these sort of islands um, as well as they're, they're modular little pieces. Um, but when you're actually walking through, I think that, you know, that's one thing when we were installing this piece um, in the gallery, uh, we took a lot of time, just as a collective group, I feel like it was just a lot of work to make sure that we had a sense. Uh, is this piece too close? Is there a sense of how it connects to another one? Uh, and those elements uh, in between are, you know, really, really important. Um, so, so that is that. That's um, the the subtle kind of nuanced space that I, you know, I really appreciate. Um, you know, others actually uh, getting out of it. So, we're going to speak really um, loud and into this, and hold the camera still. And we have two more questions. Okay. Okay. Our next question is um, from our director, our executive director. What advice do you have for emerging artists who are exploring art making that falls outside the expected, like this work? I would say to just keep making it. Um, I think that, and, and connect to others in the community. Um, make, you know, make sure that your, your voice isn't getting lost. Um, and, you know, I think ultimately having others in a very specific community to talk to, um, to bounce ideas back and forth off of uh, is really important. Um, experimentation is so, so important to, to playing. And so, and, and I think that's the key thing here too, is that um, I use the word play. It's, it's active engagement and just constructive playing with materials. Um, and sometimes it's sort of an accident that happens. And uh, as in the first piece that I, I did and created, um, it was, there were unexpected curves and sharp bends that I don't think I would have known to do had I been very, very tentative and very cautious. Um, and so that was one that 
um, you know, they, they all, all the pieces ultimately um, were a product of experimentation. Um, part of it also is, uh, you know, it, it's from experience of, you know, how, how does one thing sort of land on top of the other and, and connect? And, and it's, I, I think it's, um, you know, exploring with materials, um, finding ways to kind of attach them, you know, reattach them, thinking about uh, like to like and how, how something might relate to something else. Uh, but if for a young artist, I think really just making, just making, keep making stuff and get other people's opinions. And, um, but then at some point, don't listen to other people's opinions, right? You want to really kind of connect to the material itself. We have another question from uh, curator Stephanie Rahm. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> she would like to know, did the work change meaning or have a new meaning as the pandemic hit? Oh. Yes, is the short answer. <laughs> I think, um, going into it, um, I had a vision of what the work was going to look like um, and as a final product. Um, but I think whether or not the pandemic hit was, you know, the, the piece itself, as I've kind of mentioned before, um, it, it does live on after it leaves the studio. Any work does. And so until it sort of does reside in the space for a little bit, um, and it kind of takes on a life of its own. Um, at this point, it sort of lives without me. I don't, you know, I'm not a part of like standing here and, ex you know, explaining to people like what this what it ultimately uh, means, because I, I don't even truly know what it means yet. But the, so I, I think when the pandemic hit, it was interesting because I was already starting to um, explore, uh, you know, sort of identity, what that means, um, you know, as, um, an Asian woman uh, living in this country, um, married to um, a Caucasian man, raising a biracial child, right? And so these, these other aspects, and I'm not the only one. Um, and I think that um, having these conversations, um, this is, it's, it's, it's a product of just a part of, you know, who I am. Um, it's not, it doesn't define who I am. And it's an aspect, uh, you know, I, I would, I will continue to, keep making work. Um, but I think that, you know, that that pandemic did shift in terms of, um, well, first of all, you know, the concern was this show going to continue on, right? Is it still going to open or is it going to shutter? And do we just, do I put this on hiatus? Um, or do I just keep making it? And I think ultimately it was a great uh, um, art therapy um, for me just to be able to, it's almost like my, my the, the knitting, I, I'm sitting at home watching TV and I've got, this is like my setup um, on my, you know, couch and, you know, through just process of kind of making and making and making, you know, it, it's like, you don't have to think about this part. This is just sort of, I'm just building the, the Lego blocks to this other thing, you know, and um, so that was a great way just for me to calm myself in the midst of all the turmoil uh, that was going on in the actual, you know, outside world, so. Well, that's great. We had in addition to that question from Sharon Norman, she'd like to know, um, in addition to whether it changed during the pandemic, where do you see the work going and developing as we emerge from darkness? Oh, and hi, Shar. Thanks for the question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, th I think for, for, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm living in darkness still, but with a lot of light in, in my world, um, you know, there's so much to be grateful for and to, to be able to have this moment to share my work out to a greater art audience. Um, it, this is a really strange, I'm going to admit, you know, for all of us, a really strange setup where I'm looking into the camera and looking to uh, my humans in this room with me trying to like make this happen um, on live cam. It's, it's a first <laughs> for, for me, for um, everybody else in this involvement. But um, I, I do, I, I'm hopeful. I, I really want to be optimistic. And I think that moving forward, um, I, I think my work in particular um, could, and every day is, is different. It could go either direction. It could go really dark <laughs> and it could, you know, slowly kind of um, get lighter. Um, so we'll just have to see, <laughs> I, you know, I'm hoping for 
um, other opportunities to be able to show uh, more opportunities to be able to to grow in my work um, and to share it with uh, young artists and um, equal, you know, artists in, in, in any genre, any, um, you know, at any level. Um, and, and that's part of this community that's, that's so strong is to be able to have these conversations and, you know, just kind of keep bolstering one another up. I think that that's a really um, interesting piece that, that you leave on. I think that art has a great way of building community. I think about installation work and work such as this, where you have to engage it in a new way. Um, and you have this great opportunity for conversation with each other on like, what does this mean to me? How am I seeing this different? Um, there's real power in that, that I think is, is very interesting. Uh, we have another question from Amy, um, Amy Wisman. This is, is there a material she hasn't explored yet that she's looking forward to trying in the future? Yes. Um, thanks, Amy, for that question. I've had um, uh, John Sabra, uh, who was also um, in the same show, Hypothesis, with me. Um, he, he talked with me at length about, you know, have you thought about permanence in your work? And, and um, in terms of uh, what if you were to cast this type of shape um, out of ceramics, out of slip, potentially. And that's something that I've been kind of playing around with. Um, there is still a sense of fragility with material uh, like that. While it's, uh, you know, out of violet, and it, it can actually live, obviously, for a, a longer period of time. I do like that idea of fragility and, and thinking about how that, in terms of materiality, uh, translates metaphorically into this type of work. And so that is something that is that I've been toying around with. Just haven't really delved into it yet. But that is that is on the horizon. That's a great question. Great. Um, we're gonna leave it open. We have uh, uh, if there's any more questions, we'll just have just a moment to allow anyone to, to compose that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm gonna pop up here and um, just wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, as you can tell, Susan has a great pattern of work behind her that, that you can look into and explore. Um, and I just thank you so much for the, the deep kind of dive into history and inspiration. Um, it's super exciting to see an array of inspiration that feels different than, uh, but also has kind of this through line into your work. You can see it's like spices in, in a pot, right? It's really exciting. Um, so again, if there are no more questions, um, I think we're going to thank you all for your time tonight and joining us. Again, this is Ohio Arts Council's Red Gallery and the exhibition is Paper Routes, Women to Watch. And today was Susan Lee O'Connor. Next week, we'll have Alice Gessley Young, same time, same place. Thank you so much for joining us and to the legislature that allows this space to exist. Have a great night. <laughs>